Next speaker is Michael Tucker from the University of Hawaii, and he did his practicum at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, just a heads up, if you hear a baby, uh, don't worry about it. That's my baby in the back. Uh, but I'm, I'm Michael Tucker, uh, and I'm an observational astronomer. And computing isn't probably something you associate with observational astronomy. Uh, usually our HPC resources uh, are dedicated to things like theory simulations as we try and build you know, higher resolution, bigger, better, et cetera. But in the last five to 10 years, computing has become a really important part of how we process and analyze data uh, in astronomy. And I'll give you a little tour of how and why we do that through the lens of uh, my topic, which are astrophysical transients. And transients uh, don't have a good, ooh, are we clicker gonna work? There we go. Transients don't have a good definition, uh, at least not in the sense that exoplanets or galaxies do. Uh, but generally, transients are things that experience uh, extreme brightness variations on short time scales. And of course, the one you've probably heard of are supernovae. And here's an example of uh, supernova 2011 FE exploding in M101. But it's actually a much more diverse uh, class of objects. So here's a plot I like to show. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the typical time scale. How long can you observe uh, a certain object, ranging from about an hour to a year? Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have the brightness of the object, here ranging from 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun to a trillion. Uh, so there's obviously a huge range of parameter space here. And you see various objects uh, kind of hang out in different areas. And you've probably heard of you know, the supernovae, but there's all sorts of interesting explosive events uh, that can occur in the universe. Sorry. Uh, and it's actually really important that we understand transients, how they form, how they evolve, why do they occur, because most of the heavy metals in the universe are produced by transients. And of course, remember, for astronomers, uh, metals are anything heavier than helium. It's just a fact. Uh, but you see here, transients uh, are the green, the light blue, and the orange. And so if you want any understanding of how, you know, all the elements we find here on Earth came to be, you need to understand how transients uh, formed and evolved through cosmic time. We've actually been observing transients in the night sky for quite some time. It's a little unclear when humans saw the first one, uh, but we know for certain that Supernova 1006 was seen all over the world uh, by East Asia, China, and Japan. Uh, Air, uh, there's an ancient Arabic text describing its location, position on the sky to the point where we can go and find it with modern uh, X-ray telescopes. But of course, we had no idea what was happening. You know, this portended ill omens, famine, death, uh, et cetera. And even if you fast forward 900 years, uh, we had started to get a better handle on the theory but we still uh, didn't really have any data to test, the th test these theories. So we had started to make some progress on quantum mechanics, uh, figured out that stars can fuse hydrogen by some quantum tunneling in the core, and then of course the questions, what happens when you run out of the fuel, uh, stuff of that nature. But as you can see here, they were limited to photographic plates. And so that was a major step forward beyond you know, just using our eye as a detector. But in terms of you know, how good is data, photographic plates were not great. Uh, they were very difficult to uh, process and analyze. You know, if I told you to find the one dot that's different between these two images, uh, I would struggle to find it and I know where it is. And so you can imagine trying to look for, you know, anything that's non-static on photographic plates was almost impossible. Uh, and so this is what I call the data-starved era. We had lots of ideas, lots of theories of what could happen. We didn't have much data to actually test these ideas and see which ones held up and which ones didn't. Of course, this really changed with the dawn of the digital revolution. Uh, so you see this is the same supernova in the same galaxy I showed in my second slide. But here you can see uh, the last non-detection where we didn't observe it on the left, and then as you move to the right, it gets brighter. And so this is kind of just a weak intro uh, into what we call image subtraction. So if you have a sky survey that's surveying you know, the night sky every night, to find these transient events, you take your new image that you took last night, 
uh, and you compare it to a reference image. Usually this is built over you know, a couple weeks or so, you take your best quality images, stack them and make a good, deep, high quality reference image. And when you subtract off uh, your new and your reference, all the things that are non-variable, all the static things cancel out. The only thing left are the new or the variable objects. And so here's an example for uh, supernova discovered this year a couple weeks ago. And so just to give you an idea, this is only a tiny sliver of an actual image. You know, this is zoomed in on the object because we know it's there and I wanted to show a good example. So keep that in mind, we'll come back to it in a second. Uh, but this method has just absolutely revolutionized how we study the variable universe. So this is a, a plot showing the number of transients we've discovered per year over the last 20 years or so. And you'll see back in the early 2000s, we were doing two, maybe 300 a year. These are by targeted galaxy surveys. We had figured out supernovae exploding galaxies, so people just took pictures of galaxies and looked through them pretty much by eye to see is there a supernova there, and then we'll go and get some follow-up and study it. But you see these solid lines are sky surveys, surveys that don't target individual galaxies, they just survey the sky and do that image subtraction and then just you know, record or report to uh, publicly release, say we found a supernova here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you see over the last 20 years, we've gone from that two to 300 a year to now 23,000, 24,000 objects a year. I checked last night in the last 24 hours or so, as of last night at like 6 p.m., uh, there was 120 for the previous 24 hours. So this is just you know, a steady barrage of discoveries uh, that is just continu continuously being discovered and reported. And so of course this has revolutionized uh, how we study the variable sky and opened a lot of new doors for understanding the, the physics that goes on with some of these events. So of course this is where I have to kind of plug the survey I work with. Uh, it's called Assassin, the All Sky automated survey for supernovae. And our claim to fame is that we survey the entire sky every night. Uh, so if you have one telescope at one site, you can survey what you see, but to get the entire sky, you have to have both northern and southern hemisphere. And of course, you know, weather is always an issue. So we have multiple sites all over the globe, Hawaii, Texas, two in Chile, uh, and one in South Africa. And the other way we are able to survey the entire sky every night is by using little baby telescopes. They're essentially fancy Nikon lenses uh, that you could go buy at a, <laughs> a photography store. So, you know, I would say barely a telescope. Uh, but this allows us to cover a huge field of view and actually cover the entire uh, night sky. Because there's always a trade-off between how much of the sky you can take in a single picture and how much of the sky you can get on in the entire night. You know, taking the pictures takes time in and of itself. And so just to give you an idea of the scale that we're dealing with, and this is really where the computing aspect comes in. So here are two images. And just to show, so the cutouts along the top are about three times larger than the example I showed for image subtraction. So we're talking, you know, and the circles in each image are the same size in the full frame images. And we take about 1,500 of these images every single night through if, you know, good weather permitting, et cetera. Uh, so this is a huge data rate. We get you know, 25 gigs of data every night that we have to process, analyze, uh, and reduce, and you wanna do this pretty much in real time. If we discover something interesting, I don't wanna wait three days, because if you remember the, the transient plot I showed uh, on slide three or four, most of these objects aren't that bright for more than a week or two. So if it takes three days to process your data, you've missed half the fun. And so this is where high performance computing has really become a major player uh, in transient astronomy and surveys in general. Because you just need multiple cores, high performance machines to process the stream, and this doesn't stop. You know, We're taking data right now. We'll be taking data in two hours. So you have to be able to manage all of this data, otherwise why would people give you any funding to keep doing it? You know, If you can't keep up with your own data, what's the point? And I picked this one because this was also about the same time that uh, I received this fellowship, and it also highlights uh, the interesting things we can find when we survey the entire night sky at a daily cadence. And so you, there's a new detection on the right, uh, and at first, you know, we, dis we discover a lot of things, and this didn't immediately uh, flag our attention, but five days after we discovered it in the optical, it set off uh, an X-ray telescope on the Maxi, or the Maxi X-ray telescope on the International Space Station. 
And so this bottom plot is our full light curve uh, from the paper. And you see our UV uh, ultraviolet data is in pink and purple, our optical data is in green and orange, and then the x-rays are in gray. And so the x-rays have to be scaled down by a factor of 100 to even fit on this plot. And so this became one of the brightest objects in the x-ray sky for several weeks. And so whenever you have this much x-ray uh, emission, it usually means matter is falling onto a compact object, like a neutron star or a black hole. And so when we led the, I led the discovery paper, and the first neat thing we could do was figure out what sort, you know, what is this system? You see we have x-ray luminosity on the x-axis, uh, optical luminosity on the y-axis, and you see the black holes in blue pretty cleanly uh, separate from the neutron star systems in red, and uh, the new discovery in orange hangs out with the black holes for the entirety of its outburst. So this was a new black hole binary, so it's stealing mass from a nearby star, but the actual really interesting physics we could do uh, came from the fact that we detected it in the optical before the x-rays. So usually these things set off x-ray telescopes in space and then we follow up with ground-based telescopes. But since we caught it in the optical before the x-rays, we can actually constrain where in the disk around the black hole the outburst began. And that's because whenever these outbursts uh, occur, it's because you're going from a cold disk around the black hole to a hot ionized disk. So as you add mass on the outer edge from your companion star, lose mass on the inner edge to the black hole, the region of highest density is actually somewhere in the middle. So as you uh, add more mass, you, uh, you increase the density and eventually you get the conditions for hydrogen ionization and this is, you know, sets off, uh, this gives you optical emission because there's really strong uh, hydrogen lines in the optical, the Balmer series, but it's a runaway process and so this instability propagates inwards and outwards and you only get X-ray emission when it hits the inner edge of the disk and increases the mass transfer rate onto the black hole. So by measuring this delay between the optical and the X-rays, we can actually constrain where in the disk uh, this outburst, outburst began, and this tells us really interesting things about the disk viscosity, things that we can't really measure any other way. And this is all because we're surveying the entire sky every night, processing the data, et cetera. Now coming back to this uh, diagram, I just told you about one example, X-ray binaries. These are binary systems that produce a lot of X-rays because uh, you have that mass transfer onto a compact object. But it's been a really exciting uh, four years. I've been able to work on a whole slew of different objects, just you know, not enough time to talk about everything. But I want to use my last uh, minute or so to talk about what is actually coming up in the future. And so this is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST at the Vera Rubin. Uh, observatory, and this is gonna revolutionize the game. Uh, most, even the largest survey telescopes right now, PanStars in Hawaii, is like 1.8 meters. Uh, LSST will be an eight meter survey telescope, uh, and they do this by kind of cheating with the telescope design. You see it's kind of a, a double telescope, a uh, double mirror. But this is gonna discover more transients in its first year than we have in pretty much all of human history up until this point. I guess it's just gonna discover an unbelievable amount of transients, but I also like to end here because it shows just how integral computing has become to observational astronomy. Every night, LSST is gonna produce 20 terabytes of data, which has to be processed, you know, for people who wanna study things, the supernovae right after they explode can tell you a lot about the physics of the star that exploded. But that means you need to image the sky, reduce it, send out the alert, all within minutes. You know, if we have to wait three hours, we've missed most of the fun. And so this is really highlights uh, the amount of data uh, that observational astronomy is starting to get and why high performance computing is becoming so important. And so thank you for your time.